Good morning, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the online uh, curriculum on A to Z in implant dentistry. My name is Sasha Yovanovich. Uh, today's lecture will be focusing on posterior implant placement from a surgical perspective. And this will be the fourth lecture in the 12 lecture series A to Z in implant dentistry. Uh, first of all, when we focus on implant surgery in the posterior segment, uh, there is a series of uh, specific uh, diagnostic as well as clinical steps we have to review and always focus on. And you can see them here on uh, the screen. Uh, the first one is, of course, our diagnostics, uh, part of the, the whole patient diagnostics and part of the clinical diagnostics. And you can see here on the uh, photograph on the screen how we have study models uh, mounted and prepared for us to analyze uh, the patient's case with a diagnostic wax up. Then we proceed to the treatment planning, which um, will then obviously uh, necessitate uh, certain steps, uh, either from diagnostic skills uh, where we can go into all the radiographs as well as potentially some further uh, clinical evaluations with the patient or potentially clinical preparations for the patient. Uh, one of the questions we're going to ask ourselves, is this going to be a functional rehabilitation or is this going to be an aesthetic rehabilitation? And uh, as we're really focusing on the posterior segments, uh, this usually will be more heavily weighted towards functional rehabilitation uh, than aesthetic. And that's, of course, positive because that gives us a little bit more latitude in implant position. It gives us a little bit more latitude also in the optimal uh, vertical position as the gingival margin placement might not be as critical as uh, it is when we need an aesthetic emergence profile. And uh, to see the difference with this here, you can go into any of the lectures with the aesthetic implant placements, either single or multiple. A question which we, of course, want to know is um, what are we going to do after implant placement with the temporization for the patient? So this is a question we want to answer already prior to the implant placement. And uh, one of the areas is, is, for example, if a patient has a bridge uh, which has been diagnosed as not non-sustainable, we're going to remove the bridge, potentially remove some roots, we're going to replace it with implants. What is the patient going to wear as a temporary? It's just an example. So temporization uh, is important and how long is that going to be. Um, then based on our clinical and our diagnostic um, information, we're going to decide what kind of flap we're going to do. And you'll see some cases in a moment where we can see where we're doing flap designs uh, based on incisions. But some areas also in the posterior can be excellent for just minimal invasive therapy, which can be flapless, which is really, you know, of course, for the patient very beneficial. Uh, then we go into the step of real the implant placement. So like, you know, where, how, and uh, how many implants are going to be placed for the patient. One of the questions which is going to be based on the bone quality is really is this going to be a one-stage or a two-stage procedure. And this is going to be also necessitating then like our um, treatment of like what kind of healing abutments are we going to use. After the procedure, what's our post-op follow-up for the patient? What's the post-op treatment? And is there any other surgical procedures necessary? And then, of course, we come to the final result for the patient, which is really the restorative treatment. So you can see that this gives you a little bit of a setup for what we need to do in our patients. Um, if we don't follow a protocol, and if we don't really go through these diagnostic steps, uh, complications can easily arise. And here you can see one uh, uh, patient which was treated uh, several years ago, who then was referred to uh, my clinic where we had a complication with these posterior implants. Implants were placed in the posterior maxilla. And you can see here that, of course, the diagnosis was uh, missed. Notice here that in the radiograph, um, these implants are very, very um, malpositioned, really, from a standpoint of uh, overall um, restorative plan, the emergence profile. Also, the restorative plan, as you can see here, was allowing these implants to connect to the adjacent teeth, which then produced a certain amount of breakdown on the adjacent teeth. Um, so obviously this case was maybe not 
optimally treatment plan and this then delivered also an end result which you can see here with these two implants where significant amount of bone loss is uh, seen around the crest of the implants and together with the bridge work this then produced a hopeless situation for the patient also as this is um, somewhat also an aesthetic uh, compromise for the patient so end result in this particular complication was that we had to remove these implants and then start over again with a new diagnostics and a new treatment plan for the patient which entailed first of all bone grafting and then new implant placements in the appropriate position so this is an, um, a little disclaimer here at the beginning of the presentation that it's relatively easy to uh, also make a mistake and never enough time is really spent on the diagnostics as well as on the treatment planning prior to really like uh, commencing with the implant placement. So let's have a look at posterior implant case planning. Um, generically, let's look at these two photos which you see here. You can see here how uh, the top uh, photograph shows a single posterior molar replacement and the first thing which really comes up here in the clinical evaluation is that uh, we have a patient which has a huge amount of uh, uh, bone width apparent and also a very significant amount of keratinized soft tissue which of course is great from a standpoint of planning so this should be a pretty good uh, candidate for implant placement uh, the bottom photo demonstrates here a couple of remaining teeth which are uh, partially hopeless and a significant amount of bone missing in the horizontal dimension um, also a significant amount of bone missing in the vertical dimension and if you would see the x-ray you'd also see that the sinus have plummetized to an amount that there is actually no crest of bone left anymore so these two cases uh, immediately demonstrate the variety of patients we can see from like very uh, straightforward to very complex so what are we looking for First of all, we want to know the jaw locations. Uh, is this patient a mandibular or is it a maxillary case? It makes a difference. Uh, bone quality, it makes a difference on the anatomy, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, next thing I want to know is the edentulous span. Uh, how many teeth are missing? How many teeth are we like replacing? Is it a single tooth, uh, which usually is uh, more simple, or is it multiple, which means like you know, a more complex type of treatment? Um, then we go straight to the most essential part of an implant placement is how much bone is available so uh, is there bone missing um, if there is is it horizontally in dimension or is it vertical and a combination of both of course would be the worst from a standpoint of treatment then we want to know what the soft tissue quality is do I have to like consider mucogingival treatments in the patient or is it like in this top photograph so sufficient that we can just proceed with the implant placement then I want to know about the implant design. What kind of implant are we planning? Are we planning a parallel implant like Branamark? Or are we planning tapered like a Replace Select? Then I want to go to abutments. What are we choosing? Is this a zirconia abutment or a titanium? Depending a little bit on strength, depending on aesthetic needs, uh, we can do either or. Uh, but you know, often uh, we can also choose for like one particularly, like the zirconia, uh, for certain frameworks today.